Less than a day after repelling a direct aerial assault by Iran, Israel is weighing its response. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has met with his war cabinet. Its members are said to favor responding to the attack, but are divided over when and how hard to strike back. Iran launched more than 300 drones, cruise missiles and ballistic missiles in the overnight attack, but nearly all were intercepted by Israel, the US and other nations. World leaders have urged restraint, with US President Joe Biden telling Netanyahu that Washington will not participate in any military retaliation against Iran. Tehran says the assault was itself retaliation for an attack on its embassy in Damascus earlier this month that killed two top-ranking generals. Flashes in the sky over Jerusalem and Iron Dome in action. This footage shows the interception of missiles and drones launched by Iran. After the first ever direct military attack on Israel from Iranian territory, concern is growing over a possible further escalation. Israeli War Cabinet member Benny Gantz made a defiant statement that did little to allay those fears. This incident is not over. We will build a regional coalition and collect the price from Iran in a way and at a time that suits us. US President Joe Biden reaffirmed what he called America's ironclad commitment to the security of Israel, but the White House added Biden had told Netanyahu that the US would not participate in any Israeli counteroffensive against Iran. In Tehran, pro-government Iranians took to the streets to celebrate the wave of strikes against Israel. The elite Revolutionary Guard says the overnight assault was a response to a deadly airstrike on the Iranian embassy compound in Syria earlier this month, which killed several of its most senior commanders. Iran's mission to the United Nations wrote on social media that its attack on Israel can be deemed concluded. The Iranian foreign minister made a statement after the attack that seemed to be aimed at giving assurance that Tehran was not looking to escalate the conflict. We notified our brothers in the region, where the United States has military bases in their countries, that our goal is only to punish the Israeli regime and that we are not seeking to target American bases in the region. But as Israel says its confrontation with Iran is not over, that may do little to calm fears of a full-scale regional war. And I'm now joined by our Middle East analyst Shani Razanis. Uh, Shani, the Israeli war government has been meeting. Uh, what do we know? Uh, what came out of this meeting? It's more than five hours that they were discussing. Uh, it seems like there's a consensus in Israel that there needs to be some sort of a response. But now the question, what is that response should be? You know, we're talking about 45 years of this uh, tensions between Iran that escalated into a shadow war uh, in the last decades. And for Netanyahu, it's been his life mission uh, to fend off Iran. And he's pushing back uh, very strong for a response here. We also know he has the backing of the military and the defense minister, Gallant, who's always been more of a hardliner. And against that, we see the uh, minister, Gantz, who is uh, more of a moderate. He's also a former uh, chief of the military and uh, other two members of the cabinet trying to push back. What's on the table? What are the options? Going all in for Israel would be using this excuse and going for the Iranian nuclear uh, um, um, facilities. That would be something that Israel had had been hoping to do for a long time with international coalition. Uh, maybe they think this might be the time to get any legitimacy from the world might just be now. That would be going all in. But then other than that, there's also more moderate responses, either going directly into military bases or military facilities in, in, that were participating in the attack yesterday, sort of a tit for tat, a very mm -hmm. uh, measured response, or going for any of Iran's more strategic uh, proxies in the region, trying to attack there. And of course, there's always the covert operations, sort of the mild cyber attacks have been seeing any of these that would be the lowest level mm -hmm. of attack. So the idea is to send a message, but how can we send a message without alienating the Americans and the uh, international coalition of support that we're seeing now uh, coming together in uh, hopes, uh, in support of Israel and its, and its uh, war against Iran? That would lead uh, directly to my, my next question. What would Israel be able to gain from any military response versus what it would have to lose? Well, 
the way Israel sees it, ever since October 7th, uh, they lost their deterrence, which was one of the more strategic assets when it came to their positioning in that region, in, in the Middle East. And having lost that, they feel like the only way to gain it is with force, a lot of it. This is why we're seeing Israel uh, so aggressively uh, operating whenever it does operate. Um, so they feel like this is about the, the standing of Israel in the region for the long run. What it can lose, of course, is international support and mostly American backing. Uh, we know that Joe Biden has said very clearly he will support Israel defense efforts, but will not support any attacks. Um, he, we know we have had a, he has had a talk also with the G7 uh, uh, countries quite recently when they're all trying to form together some sort of a diplomatic package that will put pressure in Iran and hopefully convince Israel to, uh, you know, uh, fend off any attacks. And this is uh, a lot of the on the line for Israel because the very uh, idea of having a wedge between Israel and, and, and the U.S., that for itself is quite an achievement for Iran uh, in the region. So, of course, that's also on the line. Well, the defense minister, Geoff Gallan, says that this attack provides an opportunity to cement a strategic alliance. Uh, against I Iran. How could that look? Who will be a part of that? Well, of course, the Americans. We've seen the Brits, uh, UK taking uh, active part in that, and also the Sunni moderate uh, countries in the region. We know for a fact it was Jordan, Israel's neighbor, but you know, part of this alliance traditionally would also include uh, Egypt, It also has a peace agreement with Israel. We also know there were uh, willingness from the Saudis. We have all the countries that are part of the uh, um, Abram Accord, so Bahrain and so forth. This is um, Biden's uh, deal package that he's trying to sell for, for Netanyahu and his government for quite some time uh, because of Gaza, saying, listen, the bigger, if we zoom out of Gaza and the conflict, then they need to solve the Palestinian problem. We need to look at the bigger problem in the Middle East, and that is no doubt Iran. And the only way to defeat Iran on the long term is through cementing of this moderate alliance. Um, Israel needs to decide um, if it's moving its you know, a focus from Iran, from Gaza currently into Iran, what would that mean for the hostages still left in Gaza, for the goal of eradicating Hamas, who is still quite uh, active in Gaza? And that's a very tough dilemma that Israel is standing uh, in front. And that's why we're seeing this. It's very hard for the Israeli leadership now to reach a consensus. Israel has, in the last couple of years um, made progress in um, peace agreements and, and uh, making friends in the region, if you will. Is this paying off now? Well, we've seen it yesterday, no doubt. I mean, Jordanians have put their neck, uh, their neck on the line, not just for their reasons. They also want to fend off Iran. They've been seeing a lot of attacks from Iran and through Iranian proxies on their borders. Um, but, but there's no doubt that there's more than just Israel who wants to defeat Iran in the region. There's more than that. And the only problem is that the current government and the things we see in Gaza create a situation where Israel cannot really leverage that uh, properly. And this is where the Americans come in and say, please, let us try to find diplomatic ways in order to make it happen. Let's try to find a diplomatic package to put pressure on Iran. Um, and we will see partially why we will see more time before Israel takes a decision is how to make any, to, make any, to, to reach any agreement with the Americans and what would be the most appropriate response. Shani Razan is there, our Middle East expert. Thank you very You're much, welcome. Shani. Leaders of the G7 nations have condemned Iran's attack on Israel during a meeting that was convened by US President Joe Biden. Following their video conference, they said they would take measures to prevent an uncontrollable regional escalation in the Middle East. The leaders also called on Iran to exercise restraint. The group's statement pledged to work towards an immediate and sustainable ceasefire in Gaza as well. The UN Security Council is holding an emergency session over the attack. Secretary General Antonio Guterres opened the session by calling for maximum restraint, saying the region cannot afford another war. It's time to step back from the brink. It's vital to avoid any action that could lead to major military confrontations on multiple fronts in the Middle East. Civilians are already bearing the brunt and paying the highest price. And we have a shared responsibility to actively engage all parties concerned to prevent further escalation. 
Iran's overnight attack against Israel was the first of its kind. The animosity between the two nations, however, goes back decades. The October 7th terror attack against Israel was led by the Iran ally Hamas. That escalated those tensions from a proxy war to direct attacks from both sides. The October 7th terror attacks on Israel shook the entire country to its core. Hamas, widely perceived to have the backing of Iran, claimed responsibility. Iran distanced itself from the worst terrorist attack on its arch enemy, but it praised the attackers. We defend Palestine. We defend the struggle. We kiss the hands of those intelligent and brave Palestinian youths who planned the attack on the Zionist regime. We are proud of them. The U.S. quickly reacted and warned Iran to exercise caution. We're surging additional military assistance to the Israeli Defense Force, including ammunition, interceptors to replenish the Iron Dome, and we've moved the U.S. carrier fleet to the eastern Mediterranean and we're sending more fighter jets there in that region and made it clear, made it clear to the Iranians, be careful. Iranian-backed militias in Iraq and Syria, Hezbollah in Lebanon and Houthi rebels in Yemen continued to launch attacks targeting Israeli and U.S. installations and forces in the region. This is a battle against the Iranian axis, the Iranian axis of terror, which is now threatening to close the maritime strait of Bab el-Mandeb. This threatens the freedom of navigation of the entire world. Tensions escalated further. The Western world became more involved. The U.S. and Britain launched dozens of airstrikes against Iran-backed Houthi rebels in Yemen after months of attacks on Red Sea shipping. Israel also stepped up its assaults on Iranian Revolutionary Guard members and on Iranian proxies in the region. Tit-for-tat attacks continued in the Middle East. But the April missile strike on Iran's embassy in Damascus that killed Iranian generals was seen as a major blow to Iran. Something that Iran said led it to directly attack Israel from its territory. Since October 7th, Israel is believed to have assassinated at least 18 Iranian commanders outside Iran's borders. After Iran's Islamic Revolution in 1979, Iran's previously friendly relationship with Israel dramatically changed. It scrapped its recognition of Israel. Claiming to champion the Palestinian cause, the Islamic regime became so hostile towards Israel that it publicly stated it wanted to wipe Israel off the map a policy that makes Iran Israel's biggest adversary. And the current escalation shows the shadow war Iran has been waging with Israel for years now threatens to turn into a very real and a dangerous conflict. Germany's Chancellor Olaf Scholz has responded to the Iranian assault while on a trip to China, where he'll be meeting with, among others, President Xi Jinping. Here's what he had to say earlier. We strongly condemn the Iranian attack and warn against any further escalation. Iran must not continue down this path. At the same time, it's absolutely clear to us that we stand in solidarity with Israel, which has every right to defend itself. We will do everything we can to prevent further escalation and will therefore continue to pursue our current course. But we can only warn everyone, especially Iran, against continuing down this path. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz speaking there. Now let's bring in Alexander Müller. He's a member of the German Parliament, defence policy spokesman for the Free Democratic Party, which is uh, a part of the governing coalition here in Germany, uh, for their parliamentary group and chairman of the Defence uh, Committee. Now, we just heard Olaf Scholz there calling for restraint. And German arms sales uh, to Israel have been under scrutiny uh, recently. Uh, could German weapons be used by Israel to retaliate and does that worry you? 
No, um, I don't think uh, that German weapons could be uh, used because it is um, just a small part. There are no tanks, no airplanes, uh, nothing where you can uh, um, what you can use um, uh, to to attack any other country. Um, so I'm not really worried mm. that uh, German weapons would be used on this. Now, the Secretary General of your uh, party, the FDP, just called uh, for a different approach in Germany's Iran policy. Uh, what does he mean by that? Um, I think we have been too kind uh, to Iran in the in the, in the last time. Um, perhaps some more sanctions uh, should be checked uh, if we can even more, uh, more, have even more sanctions against Iran uh, to make it clear that we are not accepting that Iran and their marionettes in, in all around uh, the Arabic uh, world, in Lebanon, in uh, Yemen, and uh, everywhere else in Iraq, uh, that uh, um, that are making terrorist attacks and uh, unstabilizing uh, the world. We, we cannot, we, we do not want to um, look at this uh, without doing anything. Mm. Now, following this attack, you uh, expressed some hope for peace in the Middle East in a tweet. Uh, and that sounds a bit counterintuitive uh, at this point. Uh, what gives you reason for that optimism? Yes, DW has also uh, mentioned it. Um, the, the fact that uh, as well Saudi Arabia as also uh, Jordania, you know, Jordania, um, there are a lot of, um, or Jordan, there are a lot of uh, Palestine people living there. Um, uh, both countries have helped to um, to to take um, attacking drones, terrorist drones, uh, down from the sky um, to to help um, protect uh, Israel. And uh, those countries are not um, classical friends of Israel. And that makes me gives me some hope that we will have peace in the Near East um, in in the next years, perhaps. Now, is there anything that Germany can uh, do to help defuse the situation? Um, not a lot. Um, uh, we we are um, an intermediate between um, Israel and uh, Iran because we talk with with both sides and we try to de-escalate the situation. That's the one thing that we can do. Um, but in military um, terms, we will not uh, be involved in anything, uh, not in, uh, in in attacking Iran or something like that. Um, so it's just uh, a peace talks and uh, trying to, to talk with both sides to de-escalate. That's what we can do. Alexander Müller there, member of the German parliament. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we can now uh, speak to Hans-Jakob Schindler. He's a senior director of the counter-extremism uh, project. Uh, given the advanced warning, Mr. Schindler, why do you think Iran launched this attack? Thank you so much for having me. Uh, clearly, Iran um, was under domestic pressure of considerable proportions to show response to what it says and considers to be an attack on its sovereign soil when Israel attacked um, its consulate in Damascus. Um, however, it made uh, apparently sure that it, the damage that this uh, attack is uh, meted out in, uh, on Israel was quite limited. Not only did it publicly say when it launched the drones, the rockets, giving ample war time, but as it turns out now today, apparently the Iranians briefed the Turkish government, who then in turn briefed the U.S. government, and that uh, the attack is coming and it's going to be quite limited. But, uh, unfortunately, uh, we are now in a situation that Iran, for the very first time, has attacked Israel. And that really puts a lot of pressure on the Israeli government, in turn, to now also respond. And the response is going to determine on whether the situation stabilizes, escalates, or slides into a regional war. Mm. I mean, if you just look into your crystal ball, what would be a likely reaction, do you think, from Israel? Well, it depends on whether you are an optimist or a pessimist. An optimist would say a attack that is more or less signaling, yes, we are responding forcefully, but it's business as usual. So an attack against um, the arsenal of Hezbollah, which is an immediate tactical threat towards Israel because its uh, missile uh, arsenal can actually overwhelm simply with the amount of uh, ammunitions that they have, Israeli air defenses. 
However, if you're a pessimist, you could say, okay, this is also a moment, if there ever was one, where Israel could clearly decide that it is now time to take out the Iranian nuclear facilities, which is a long-term, very strategic threat against the existence of Israel. Um, this would, of course, then really result into unforeseeable, really, regional escalations. Well, how likely, you think, uh, is this to escalate into a regional uh, escalation, a full-blown war between Israel and Iran? Well, I mean, we could clearly see that all sides are trying to calm down both sides. So the Jordanian king apparently told President Biden if the Gazan situation could be resolved, um, this could not, you know, easily escalate again. Um, the Russians and the Chinese, as well as the Egyptians have called for calmness. The G7 has come for calmness in just over 90 minutes. The Security Council here is going to meet in New York. Obviously, it's going to condemn the attack, but I, I hope that the Security Council will also call for a measured uh, and, and considerate uh, further actions from all sides. So um, the diplomatic efforts are there. However, it, it just simply is a very difficult situation For Israel, um, it now, for the future, will have to always contend with the risk that if it moves in any way, shape or form against major figures of is Iranian proxies or major figures of the IIGC, which are supporting these proxies, which present a direct threat to Iran and it, uh, to Israel and its, its territory, that it would have to always also consider a potential Iranian airstrike. Um, this is really a change paradigm here, and we've not yet found a new equilibrium in the way that existed before years. Everybody keeps pointing uh, at the risk of escalation uh, in the Middle East uh, beyond uh, Israel and Iran. Uh, is there this risk and, and, and what is the risk? Who else could be getting involved in, in, in fighting each other? No, we are now already in a very tense situation with not one, but several of the Iranian proxies uh, around as well. So not just Hamas, but also already Hezbollah. The Houthis are continuing to harass shipping in the Red Sea and were shooting missiles and drones towards Israel last night. We have the Iraqi and Syrian proxies that were also apparently in some way, shape or form involved in last night's attacks. These, these proxies are, of course, instruments of the Iranian regime. But they are not, uh, they don't all have an on, an on and off lever. The closest that uh, Iran comes to fully control a proxy really is Hezbollah because it is an Iranian generation. However, the Houthis are far more radical um, than even the Iranians are. Their slogan is death to Israel, death to the United States, a curse upon the Jews. Um, and they are much harder to control. So escalation um, and in this current situation where everyone is on a knife's edge could also come simply by these proxies without any particular Israeli action or however measured the Israeli reaction would be. Now, uh, Jordan has intercepted missiles over its territory as well. Is Jordan likely to get involved more than that? Well, number one, Jordan has uh, the second oldest peace treaty with Israel after Egypt. So obviously it's been in a very close uh, relationship with Israel um, for uh, quite a long time. However, I don't think militarily, um, the Jordanian army would be getting involved in an attack on Iran. Jordan and Iran don't have a good relationship. Neither does Saudi Arabia, who also last night shot down some missiles and drones, apparently from the Houthis uh, that were heading towards Israel. Not the first time, by the way. They have done this several times the last couple of months. So the, the battle lines are clear. There is a, of course, anti-Iranian majority. And then there is what the Iranians call the axis of resistance, i.e. Iran, certain uh, um, elements in Iraq, Uh, definitely the Syrian regime and its proxies. And I'm not really surprised that both Jordan, uh, Jordan and uh, Saudi Arabia were at least defending their own territory against this blatant violation of their space by the Iranians last night. Now, US President Joe Biden said uh, that the US would not participate in a counteroffensive against Iran. So let's talk about the wording here, not participate, but maybe tolerate. I mean, President Biden also said he, his support and U.S. support for Israel is ironclad. Obviously, that extends to the fullest extent when it comes to the defense of Israel, even the defense of the Israel, uh, when there is a re should there be a reaction against the Israeli answer to the attack last night. However, clearly, uh, the uh, U.S. administration, as indeed, in fact, the Israeli 
or the uh, government or the Iranian regime, none of these three players are fundamentally at this point interested into starting a large-scale regional war. The problem is how can you prevent, uh, you know, the sliding into this war without anyone want, wanting it? It wouldn't be the first situation where wars start without any really seeing this in their interest. Thank you very much. That was Hans-Jakob Schindler from the Counter-Extremism Project. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.